Hello and welcome. Today we're going to make open faced turkey sandwiches, which basically means we're making gravy. Most of the rest of it's done for us. As always, to start off with, I'd like to thank everyone who's watching and has subscribed and liking the videos. It means the world to me. And if you aren't already, hit that subscribe button and you might want to hit the notification bell because Google's not great at notifying you otherwise. All right, for our ingredients, we're going to need one cup turkey or chicken broth, two tablespoons worth of flour, two tablespoons worth of butter, salt, pepper, sandwich bread, and turkey that I forgot to take a picture out of. The first thing we need to do for our gravy is melt our butter. This is the first half of our roux. The other half will be our flour, and it's just 50% fat, 50% flour. So in this case, we just want to get it to melt, but we don't want to brown or possibly scorch any of the butter fats because we need those for the thickening process. So you want to go with like either a low or possibly a medium, just a little bit under medium heat. On medium low, this took me about two minutes or so. Once all of our butter is melted, we just want to slowly incorporate the flour. Now, the easiest way I have found is to run it through a metal strainer like this, but just a fine strainer, you can just tap it every once in a while as you're mixing it in to bring it all together. And what we're looking for is for it to come together and become a paste. So this is the first of two steps that will prevent or possibly cause a clumping in your gravy. In this case, if we add the flour too fast, only some of it will start to absorb into the butter and some of it will end up just basically next to pasty side and you would get clumps and that's not what we want. The nice smooth gravy requires these next two steps, this one and the very next one, to be done at a very slow pace. Now, I'm gonna speed this up in the background, but this took about two and a half to three minutes to mix this all in to the paste consistency. One of the nice things about making a roux like this is you don't have to be exact on the flour to fat. If you've got two tablespoons of butter, you can just add enough flour until you reach that paste consistency, and therefore you don't necessarily have to be super exact and measure any of this stuff out for the flour in the roux making. Most people who do a lot of gravies will tend to end up with a bag of flour somewhere near their, or at least a jar of flour somewhere near where they cook at, and they'll just add it by volume and sight, just kind of dropping it in until it reaches the paste-like consistency. So now that we have gotten that, we will move on to the next step, which is also going to need to be done very slowly. All right, now that we have made our paste, let's unmake that paste. What we need to do right now is the longest and slowest part. We need to slowly add our liquid into the paste. And we wanna make sure that it is fully incorporated into the paste. So essentially the reverse of what we just did by adding the flour, in this case, we're adding the liquid in to the flour and we wanna make sure that everything gets absorbed into the paste first. This makes sure that your gravy will not have clumps. Now flour, when it gets wet, will start to harden a little bit. So if you add too much liquid, that outer outside is going to basically form the gluten and it's going to not let moisture penetrate through so you'll get those clumps. That's what causes clumps. So the first step where we had to slowly make a paste followed by the second step where we take our broth and we slowly make it into the gravy itself by slowly incorporating that into our paste. There's a couple of times here where I went a little bit too fast and if you can, you can actually see it where it kind of looks like it's starting to form some clumps. Thankfully, I was able to get everything incorporated and not have any clumps, but this would have been where it would happen. The step here and the previous step have to be done really slow to make sure that you don't get clumps. One of the really bad part about clumps is when they're small ones. When you get graininess in it, it is so off-putting in a gravy. So you really, and this is the stage where that would happen because you're basically, if you mix in the majority too soon, because at, there's gonna come a point where it's okay to just mix all of it, the rest of the liquid in, but if you do that too soon, then it'll actually be grainy. So again, it's one of those things where the more patience you have and the more time you have to spend on this step, the better your results are going to be. This is also going to incur a small amount of browning in the beginning portions of it in, onto the roux, which is going to give a small amount of nutty flavor. And in this case, by doing this slowly and doing it properly, you're going to get an expanded flavor for this gravy because of how it heats and how everything works and you get that small amount of nuttiness and brownness. Now, this is because as we took very slow amounts of time to mix in, it still 
have a little bit of areas that were dry enough that the burner would actually brown them versus just getting drowned out by the liquid. Now, once we've reached this stage, which is about five minutes of mixing, it's going to be the part where we need to pay attention to what our texture is. Once our roux starts to look like this, we're getting close to where we can start testing to see if it is ready. Now, if you have a whisk, is all we'll be looking for is for it to not cling very well to the whisk when we take it up. So I'll show you that here in a moment and I'll show you as we're testing it. I'm watching it drip off my whisk and so I know it's getting closer because it's starting to no longer leave a, bug, a big clump on the whisk. And I'll keep doing that for a while until I see it do this. So once you see it start to do that, you know you're only like one or two more mixes away from it. And it will essentially not cling at all. It would be like about as clingy as maple syrup. It's not going to stay on the whisk. And that's when you know it's time to add the rest. And once you add the rest, just make sure we whisk it right in. And then we are almost done. We did get the two really, really, really long. You need some patience for this part's done, though. All right, from there, we just need to bring this all the way up to a boil and let it boil for about 30 seconds to a minute. You don't want to go much past that because at that point, the flour, the proteins in the flour would actually start to break down and it would no longer be able to thicken as well as it's going to. So this is also the point where we would normally start tasting for saltiness and pepper. So I would recommend that you add your pepper at the very least here and you should definitely taste it and see if it's salty enough. And if not, you can add a little bit, but you also need to know whether or not your lunch meat is salty. So if your turkey's a little salty, then you'll want a little bit less salt in the gravy. So that is something to pay attention to because if your turkey's salty, it's going to make everything seem saltier. So even if you properly season the gravy, it still comes out just a little bit on the, well, salty side. I find that about a half a teaspoon of each at this point will mostly cover it if your broth is on the salty side. Mine ended up taking about four and a half, five minutes to come back up to a full boil. Once it begins to bubble like this, that's when you're gonna have to pay just a tiny bit more attention to it. You might have to stir a little bit more often. And the reason for that is also because that stirring is gonna be one of your signs when you're getting ready, when it's just about done. And that'll be the first of the two we're looking for at the end here. And what that's going to be is that you'll stir and it's not going to immediately start bubbling again, but it's only going to take like five or 10 seconds, maybe 20 at most. So jumping ahead to that, we will have reached a, what they call rolling boil. And that means that it's just going to continue boiling. And this is what we're looking for. And that's at the peak where we need it to be. Now we're checking for nappe here is what they call that. And that's where you can make a line across the back of a spoon and the liquid does not come back together. It's sufficiently thick to stay separated. And that's what we're looking for as the final, okay, our gravy is ready. Now what you do is literally turn off the heat altogether. It might not look thick enough at the moment, but it is going to thicken additionally as it cools off. So that's one of the reasons we want to make sure we turn it off. And the other reason is it's because of how thick it is. If we don't turn the heat all the way off, even going down to simmer is going to retain a lot of heat because the liquid itself can't move very well. So going all the way off, this would be ready for the rest of our sandwiches as soon as we have them prepared. Once it's cooled off for about 10 minutes or so, you'll notice it's about this texture, which is perfect texture for an open-faced turkey sandwich. And now we get all the easy parts because everything else is done for us. Okay, one final note before we put things together on the turkey. If you notice, some of the sections here is a little bit thin. You want them to be on the thicker side, probably about a quarter of an inch to a third of an inch thick. And if you just ask for thick cut at the deli, they'll cut it perfectly for you. And the reason for this is it holds up a little better in our sandwich. Hello, by who? All right, for construction, we're gonna go with the standard classic diner look, and that's gonna be toast your bread, then cut it corner to corner, and then you wanna put it together like this. Next up, your turkey. Now, uh, what I typically do is cut the slices in half, and so reverse them to the straight side on the outside so they match with the bread, which gives you a better gravy cascade effect. 
And speaking of gravy cascade effect, as you can see, once you do it this way, if you have the meat piled up a little bit in the middle, which is also one of the reasons to make everything overlap in the middle, it's going to cause it to basically flow down like almost like a volcano. It's a nice, very appealing look for something that really needs more appeal to its looks. Gravy's not very attractive, but it is tasty. And with the gravy on, I'm going to garnish mine with a little bit of parsley, as you saw there. But that lets us complete our open-faced turkey sandwich. This is a sandwich that was actually a very popular item in diners in the 1950s and 60s, and sort of any of the retro diners you can still find these at sometimes. But it is getting harder and harder to find, which is sort of why I made this, because I had a craving for it, but I don't know any place to get it anymore. And I don't feel like now is the time to experiment with new places. So... <laughs> If you have a craving for this, this could work out for you too. Thank you for watching. Have a great day and a great meal.